welcome to the first episode of the fifth season of Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 28th of February 2012, and in this episode we're going to discuss this week's hot topic and interview Mahendra Mehi about Dev8D. We will also cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, and go over your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in our IRC channel. I'm Alan. With me this week is Tony. Hello. Mark. Hello. And Andy. Welcome Hello. back. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. What have you been up to? What have I been up to? I've been up to lots of, th- lots of things. I, I, um, I resigned from my job. Oh, my life. Excellent. What, to come here? No, well, no. no. <laughs> well, it is a pretty well, requirement. We, we don't pay well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll be doing something new quite soon, but I can't really talk about it just yet because it's kind of in between things. But so what are you doing at the moment while in you're between, in between? In between, I've done lots of things. So I did an event called Hack to the Future, which is a, a coding for kids event up in Preston for uh, on a Saturday, which was exciting. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah. Um, and I took some nanodes up there. So we saw the nanodes at um, Og Camp last oh, year, yeah, the, yeah. the little Arduino yeah. um, clone things. People so, were soldering them up. They were so. I did some similar things up at the uh, at the Hack to the Future, and then also I've done a Makeathon. I've blogged about that. That was really quite exciting with lots of product designers, and we did some. Uh, we built a community telephone using a load of web service APIs, which is very fun. Cool. Wow. Um, I went to the PHP conference in London uh, last week. So yeah, loads of things. Keeping busy. Is it true you've actually done more since you left your job? <laughs> <laughs> um, more what? More interesting? No, sorry. Um, I've done a lot of things. Yes. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, sounds like you're having fun. Excellent. And putting us all to shame with all our things yeah. we've been doing. How about you, Tony? What have you been up to? Uh, I've been trying to remember what all these buttons do on this equipment. <laughs> I spent about two hours last night trying to remember how it all went together, and I still yes. didn't get it quite right. But we're here, and hopefully people are listening live. And you are recording speak. this. And I think I'm recording this. <laughs> Good. Good. 99% sure we're recording it. And before yesterday... and uh, Yeah, I had a good Christmas, um, New Year. <laughs> I got a coconut... For Christmas, seriously, yeah, that like a lot times of are hard. <laughs> times are hard. I know we're yeah. in a time of austerity, but uh... from my parents. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I think they're starting to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a comment on your hair or anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cheeky, <laughs> right? Okay. And um, Mark, hello, hello, how are you? Welcome back. How, what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Uh, I went to an event called Dev Eight D, which we'll probably hear a bit more about later. Uh, so I won't go into that too much now. Um, I. Installed some updates on my home desktop, my Kubuntu desktop. Good and, move, yeah. Um, I rebooted and X wouldn't start, so that was fun. Turned out what had happened was my disk had filled up and nothing had told me that. And, uh, and it filled up with all your backups that you do. No, I back up to my server. Thank you very much. He backs up to his personal cloud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I filed a bug saying perhaps App should warn you if that's about to happen. And someone said, that's probably a good idea which is the first time that's ever happened when I filed a bug, so I was quite proud. <laughs> it's on the road. Normally roadmap. I get, no, not going to do that. Oh. Won't fix. Yeah. <laughs> what about you then, Alan? You must have done something interesting. Um, well, um, at work we've done some interesting stuff, yeah. Okay, uh, anything you can tell us about? Uh, well, the stuff you've seen, Ubuntu TV. Oh, yes, we've had those announcements. As yeah. I predicted... Did you? <laughs> in the, uh, in the oh, we're going to have the review at the no, end of I'll the year. No, I'll save that for December this year. Good. Although, interestingly, the year before, we had some sort of prediction about dual-core phones running some sort of virtualized dual-booty thing, which isn't quite what we've got with uh, Ubuntu for Android, but it's not far off. Yeah. Um, but we have had the announcement of Ubuntu TV, which is yep. like a, me- the code media, is out a media playing thing. Yeah, kind of. Kind yeah, of. It's a- like the... 10 foot interface you get on the on the tv you can lean back and you know watch media and stuff and it's really a, a demo they're showing it they showed it off at ces and also at um uh mobile world congress which is on this week in barcelona so when can i buy oh, one? right well the code is out there so you can, <laughs> you can, can download and make your own yeah, um, brilliant but that's the uh, kind of thing i like but the but the yeah the devices aren't available yet that's oh. a shame Right. I thought okay. you were going to bring them all to us for, you know, as a, as a season five, you know. This isn't Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> put everyone a telly. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Okay. Well, that's a nice roundup of everybody. Um, Laura can't be with us today, is it? I don't know if we mentioned that. She hopes to be back next episode, but she's <gasps> sat on a train somewhere. Sorry. She's coming yeah. back. Oh, she is coming back. She didn't yeah. tell me that. Yeah, it was I a very short term like... contract. Oh, Andy. no. <laughs> and uh, we better get on with the show.
One of the new features we're going to be having in this season is uh, a bit of a debate, as we're calling it, hot topic. <laughs> for uh, those Partridge fans of you. Sorry, <laughs> Um, so each episode, or whenever we choose to do this, <laughs> <laughs> should we choose to do it again, we will be uh, choosing a subject. We're going to have one of the members of the team speaking up for the uh, the subject and somebody else speaking against it. And then we're going to have some questions and comments. So if you're listening live, you can leave your comments on Google+, Plus, on Twitter, at UUPC, and in the IRC channel, you're using the web chat facility, um, and contribute to the debate. And Andy is going to be fielding those and, and uh, dropping <laughs> can, them into the conversation. Can we add any more sources that I have to monitor at the Carrier same time? Carrier pigeon. Email. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Give uh, you Andy's phone number if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then at the end, we're going to have a uh, some sort of conclusion slash vote. <laughs> uh, wow. About Your 12, optimism knows no bounds. About Battle tw- Royale. Yeah. 12 minutes to work out how that's going to work. Um <laughs> So the motion we're going to be talking about today is Unity is the best choice for the future of Ubuntu. You can take that any which way you like. (laughs) Speaking for the motion first is going to be Alan. So over to you. Right. With well over 20 million users worldwide, Ubuntu is the most popular Linux desktop. In the eight years since its first inception, the number of Linux users has grown and Ubuntu has been at the head of that growth curve. All kinds of people use Ubuntu, from artists to beekeepers, clerics, dentists, engineers and farmers. And people use Ubuntu for lots of different reasons. For many, it's an alternative to the tried and untrusted Windows, or the cheaper and more open option to Apple. People come for the experience and they stay for the free software. Ever since Ubuntu started, Canonical has been instrumental in shepherding the distribution through the creation of 16 releases. Canonical has played a major part in the community, providing support, development resources, security updates, sponsorship and help to Ubuntu users and developers around the world. Now, 20 million users is great, but it's not a massive dent in the global desktop market. Most conservative estimates suggest Linux as a whole has no more than 1% of that segment, probably significantly less. Now, Mark Shuttleworth has repeatedly articulated that he wants to take a chunk of that market and wants to do it by having a desirable product, which is better than the competition, not just an also-ran or low-quality alternative to the main players. In the early days, it was common on Linux to manually edit your XOR configuration in a console, and you'd sometimes download and compile applications and their dependencies yourself, and even build your own kernel. And there was no way of knowing whether a PC or peripheral would work until you went out and bought one, or you knew someone in your Linux user group who already had one. Some people, like us, enjoy all of that. Most people, however, don't. Most, in quotes, normal people, want to use a computer as a tool, and no matter how much geeks protest and conjole them into learning more about the underlying infrastructure, they don't want or need to. These days, they just want to communicate, create, consume, and be entertained. Running configure, make, make install isn't a feature for them, it's a chore. Over the years since Warty was released, many of the problems associated with running a Linux desktop have been removed or mitigated. We now have software which automatically gets network and video drivers for you and automatically detects codecs required and downloads those. We have automatic crash reporting and a display server which brings up a GUI without asking you arcane questions about your horizontal refresh rates first. (laughs) We have automatic printer and scanner detection and a huge range of consumer devices and support for installing all kinds of proprietary products that people actually use. For the most part, for most people, on most setups, Ubuntu just works, and that's a massive win for everyone involved. So it's game over, right? We won. Well, no. We need Ubuntu to be on devices that people buy in bricks and mortar shops and online. We need to be pre-installed on any shape and size of device right out of the factory if we're going to stand any chance of appealing to customers. And before we can appeal to customers, we need to appeal to the device manufacturers. They have to want to put our software on their hardware. They don't want to sell a substandard, partly working solution. They want it to work and they want it to look great. I believe that Unity is the user interface to get us to that goal. Unity was designed with the user in mind and with consideration for mainstream hardware vendors. I believe that Unity can be pre-installed on millions of new computers and shipped to these normal people where they can use it to do all the low-tech stuff they need it for, as well as the high-performance, creative and consumptive tasks that the great swathes of users want to do. It's beautiful, easy to use, expandable, and more importantly, it's free software. 
Lovely. Thank you very much, Alan. And you were well within your, your time limit. You were about uh, 30 seconds short of your time limit, time limit. So well done for oh, speaking to Leave them. a bit of room for everyone else and maybe for me to breathe now. Yes. You can recover while Mark gives you his view why what you've just said is a load of old codswallop. <laughs> Unity is not the best choice for the future of Ubuntu. For a start, Unity is divisive. We've seen through the way it was developed in behind closed doors and the way it was dropped on the community and the Ubuntu community and users were told you can use that you will use this. This is how it's going to work. Um, that it drives it goes against the whole open source ethic. Um, as a result of that, we've seen a similar situation to what we had when XGL came out, where the uh, XGL platform was de developed behind closed doors by Novell. And Novell dropped it and said, this is what we're going to go with. And then a year or so later, it there was never heard of again. Um, through a similar, so as a similar result, uh, Unity has ended up being the only, sorry, Ubuntu is now the only uh, distro that uses Unity. And any other attempts to get it into other distros have either petered out or lost interest uh, since the initial interest started. Uh, Similarly, Unity is now the only uh, win, um, sorry, desktop environment which uses Compiz. Now, the result of that means that Ubuntu, as a project, no longer has the community connections to draw on, which it would have if it was still using, for instance, GNOME. It doesn't have the advantage of if a problem gets fixed in another distro, it doesn't have the same uh, advantages of pulling in those uh, those fixes for Ubuntu users. So that means that Ubuntu as a project has lost out and Ubuntu's users have lost out as well. From a usability point of view, um, uh, Unity is inflexible for power users. Many people have complained about the way that Unity uh, is prescriptive and says, you will have these buttons here, and if you don't like it, tough. Uh, any attempt to change, for example, the position of the dock requires you to sorry, launcher, <laughs> requires you to install a completely different Compiz plugin just to have it rotated, for instance, to the bottom of the screen. Uh, while there are configuration options, it requires you to install Compiz Config Settings Manager. There isn't anything like you have in KDE where you simply unlock the, uh, the settings and change them as you wish. In fact, even in Windows, if you want to change the position of the launcher there, you simply drag it to the other side of the screen. And that's the kind of, uh, the kind of customization that power users like. While it restricts power users, it also provides confusion for new users switching from other systems. Uh, if you're going to bring in new users, you have to give them a system which they can get on with and use straight away. Yet Unity, uh, in several of its new features, has taken away some of this familiarity for example scroll bars in unity uh, are a thin little slither down the side of the screen in some applications this is uh, while this has changed and will confuse users in some applications it's also inconsistent in that not every application behaves in this way so it's going to cause confusion similarly the global menu while it might be familiar to mac users many people might not be able to find them because there was the decision made to have them hide by default. Um, now, the the way that Unity was brought to the community, I mentioned before, caused some uproar and as a result drove many very vocal users away from Ubuntu. While it may have brought in many users, because the users who left were so vocal and the users who came in were much less vocal... You need to be wrapping up in the next few seconds. That's what I was planning to do. Uh, <laughs> um, the people who have come in haven't counteracted the damage to Ubuntu's reputation within the community that those leaving so vocally had. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. We need a system of lights for next time. A giant clock. I was trying to remember what, what time I needed to get to on the yeah. clock. I'll just throw things at you in future. So thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, so Andy's been monitoring various sort of uh, social feeds. Yep. Um, what sort of questions or statements of point of view uh, are coming across so, there? And so, the, the two participants can rebut them if they feel... Yeah, they sure. To. So we, 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 we opened this up um, before we started the live show. And we've had a few comments. Uh, Graham Castleton uh, in Google Plus talking about the fact that he, he kind of really likes it. And, and actually when people have kind of then uh, in the discussion there... Uh, said that you know, pointed out some of the the bad features. He's kind of said, well, the only problem he had was around 
understanding how to open a new instance of an app. Quite a few people are talking about the learning curve, the fact that it's not obvious how to do things. Um, bring back, you know, again, as Mark was kind of saying there, some of the some of the ways of um, that the user interface has been changed in Unity is, is unfamiliar to people. That's a good question, Alan, because it's quite different from what people have been used to on GNOME 2, and it's quite different from what people uh, are used to with a traditional Windows desktop. Is that disconnect a problem? Um, well, I don't think it's something that affects only us. I think uh, GNOME 3 has a similar level of um, new user discoverability issues, um, that one example that a lot of people cite is the fact that there's no shutdown button. You have to hold down the alt key in order to activate the shutdown button, which to some people is bizarre in the same way that on um, Unity, people might find it bizarre that the menu is you know is kind of hidden by default. Um, but it actually doesn't take long to discover those things. Um, we're trying to make them more discoverable. Um, for example, in the latest release, if you hold down the super key, um, it pops up a full screen uh, image that tells you all of the keyboard shortcuts that you could possibly want to know. Um, so we we do listen to that feedback, and yeah, we're so trying, trying to fix just, that. Just a comment from me, though. Doesn't that what you just described? The fact that you might hold down the super button and then you get a thing of keyboard shortcuts. I mean, what's the approach? I mean, it seems to be very mixed between loads of power user kind of keyboard shortcut controls, plus also the kind of touch or kind of big icon kind of view of the world. Um, we don't really have so much of a big icon view of the world. They they look big initially, but you can shrink those down now. <laughs> so oh, that's all right. Yeah, so that, that's fixed that one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there, there's a I, I I can see where you're going, and it feels like there's a common misconception, which is that Unity was designed for touch screens, and therefore it has no place on a desktop, and no place on a netbook, and you know no place on a on a laptop. And I, I don't think that that holds true. I, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like a touch interface. Yeah, okay. It's got buttons that look like iPhone apps, but it's not a touch interface. Perhaps but, the problem is that uh, it looks quite a lot like a touch interface. Yet it's. Uh, yet you need this hidden guide to how to use the keyboard. So mm. people's expectations are going to be a bit sort of skewed and maybe confused by this disconnect. So, yeah. so one of the interesting comments actually was from. Uh, Andre Simp, Sind MP on Twitter, saying that the uh, the actual actually the things like the HUD are a great idea because with voice commands it's going to be really useful for um, accessibility and, and disabled users and things. So, Mark, what do you think about kind of those those kind of thoughts that um, actually by by innovating here we may may actually be opening that that kind of thing up? It's yeah, I mean I agree that it has a lot of potential from that point of view. Um, I mean, but that's not vastly different from having a command line which you can give voice commands to. At the end of the day, a a voice um a voice interface would be quite similar to a command line in terms of the way you would use it so um i don't think it's vastly innovative uh beyond i mean uh, other than the fact that it gives you access to the menus rather than just to an application and more importantly we don't have that voice facility on linux really um like we do on perhaps uh, an iphone so there's a couple of people as well saying that they actually actually successfully converted people to Ubuntu and, and to Linux. Um, so uh, Victor1998 in, in the uh, chat room is talking about the fact that he's, uh, I think he's said he converted about six people um, yeah. to, 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 to because of Unity and because it's actually more um, usable and for them. So, Non-technical users and family, I think he said. Yeah, absolutely. So it seems to be, there does seem to be, uh, just as there is in the, here in the studio, um, some, some, something of a divide between those people who are kind of saying, well, actually the, the choice, you know, I'd rather not have to use it and, and we're being forced down that route. We're, and some people saying, actually, there's some good advantages. Well, we, uh, we have to draw a conclusion. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. That, Alan. <laughs> There's been quite a lot of debate going on on the IRC channel and I think uh, other places that Andy's been monitoring as well, Google Plus and what have you. So thank you for everybody who's taken, uh, has taken part. Thank you to Alan and Mark for putting their arguments across. Uh, we've had a rough straw poll in the IRC channel um, and the, the winner of the debate this week uh, is Alan. Oh, um, so are we keeping score this season? Uh, <laughs> no, maybe not. Is this but, replacing the quiz? Uh, un <laughs> unsurprisingly, Ubuntu users but, like Unity. <laughs> the people who listen to the Ubuntu <laughs> podcast knew? like but Victor, Unity. Victor 1998 also says that next week we have to debate the merits of Gnome Shell. So Alan's going to be supporting that as well. <laughs> <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> 
But thank you for preparing your arguments, gentlemen. And uh, we will have another topic in a future episode. If you've got any suggestions of what you'd like to hear us debate, um, why not send them in to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or any of the other ways that you can get in touch with us listed on the website. And now it's time for the news. Canonical has announced Ubuntu for Android, a system that will give dual-core smartphones running Android the ability to power a full Ubuntu desktop or laptop system when docked with an accompanying peripheral. Now, um, I just watched a video about this today, actually, a, the YouTube video from the Mobile World Congress, and it looked okay. like it's effectively just a little docking station. You plug a keyboard in and the, the, the phone suddenly just becomes Ubuntu. And, mm. runs, and then, in, in fact, in, inside your Ubuntu desktop, you can run your Android apps in a, like, a, I don't know, it was an window. emulator in a window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It it's, looks quite sweet, although I don't think my HTC Hero is up to the <laughs> oh, job. Wow. Alan's HTC Hero, more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the thing. It's really designed for um, the next generation of, of smartphones. Mm. That's the idea. It's not, you know, the current or get... It's not like the old Linux thing of you could use this on an old piece of hardware to reprovision an old piece of hardware and use it because the, the machine they're demoing it on is, I don't know, Motorola Atrix or something, which is a fairly beefy phone. Yeah. So th we're talking here about future phones and, you know, the, um, the kind of things that are beefy enough to run, you know, Android Plus. Ubuntu. Okay. Sounds fair. A proposal for adding DRM to HTML5 video called Encrypted Media Extensions has come under fire from Mozilla and WG, among others, who have said it is unethical and doesn't provide robust content protection. Oh dear. <laughs> Shock horror DRM that doesn't provide robust content protection. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we already solved the DRM problem? Isn't that ultraviolet the solution to all of our... Um, DRM needs. Sorry, ultraviolet. Explain. Ultraviolet is a system that's um, it's a DRM system which, if I'm right, m has buy-in from multiple content providers like the studios. Um, it doesn't mandate a specific protocol, so the it can be implemented in a number of different ways. And say, for example, you buy a film. I don't. I don't buy films. I bitch okay. around them. So. <laughs> Sorry, did I just say that live on the internet? So let's say a normal person buys a film and they get it from provider A, like Netflix or, or whatever. In theory, you could use a completely different device that uses a completely different um, implementation of ultraviolet to get the same film and you've only paid for it once. But will that work with HTML5? Well, that's the thing. Someone needs to implement the, 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 the bit in HTML5. And yes, that would be DRM. Yeah. And that would be clearly evil, according to lots of people. But it, it, it's a lot better than the system we have now, which is, no you know, video. no video. <laughs> yes. Astrology company software. Sorry, I'll start that again. Astrology software company Astrolabe have withdrawn their case against the maintainers of the Time Zone database after a defense was mounted by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Astrolabe say that their lawsuit was based on a flawed understanding of the law and that they now recognise that historical facts are no one's property. <laughs> Basically, we were idiots. Yes. <laughs> One up for the common sense party there. I think <laughs> that they had tried to sort of say that information that was taken out of, of their reference works, facts yeah. in their reference works, were copyrighted and therefore nobody else could say that fact in any other form, basically. <laughs> you goodness. can't possibly say it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I've copyrighted What's the that? time? It's a military secret. <laughs> <laughs> And in uh, unfortunate news, it seems that Adobe and Google have made a deal to ensure that Flash uh, is only available on Linux within Chrome and not on any other uh, browser or uh, independently. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> don't so, well, know how I feel about that. They'd already canned air, hadn't they, for uh, Linux, and they're, yeah. they're getting rid of Flash and only enabling Google to put it into Chrome to distribute on Linux. So why are we... I thought we hated, only, don't we hate Flash? It's proprietary. Well, we do. Yeah. We do. Yeah, but it's kind of annoying that you know they're making a deal that that separates out and makes sure that that is only available through one plugin system that's only implemented by one browser. It's it does know, seem what, what happened to the open web and Google <laughs> of all people. You know. Yeah, that's the surprising thing. It isn't Adobe; it's the Google aspect, isn't yeah. it? Well, I, mm, yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from there, but on the other hand, I, I guess they're just trying to enable some backward compatibility until the the web stuff and all this DRM and HTML5 and all this other exciting things 
get, get going, right? I mean, then not wanting to be a Google apologist, but no, 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 it doesn't yeah, sound like makes the worst, sense. Yeah. That worst does make sense. thing in the world. It's just an unfortunate stepping stone for us to go through is that in the interim, until Flash dies in a fire and we have... <laughs> And we have, you know, excellent HTML5 and other stuff that mm. can fulfil all of those requirements. We have to go through a period of us not having a, a, a plugin. A bit like Java. Uh, I don't know. We Maybe. haven't got Java because it got withdrawn. Oh, then. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. that was only <laughs> the open one. No, well, something they could... That didn't last long. I, I yeah. can see this lasting a fair while. Yes. Right. I okay. can also see people working around it as well. That's the end of the news. And uh, we have one event to uh, mention. So I was at the PHP conference uh, in London last week and I saw Lorna Jane there, who uh, you may remember if you were at Ah, Oddcamp. Yes. Um, who she did a talk about careers. She did a great talk. It was, uh, it was very well received. Um, so she was promoting the PHP Northwest group, who have a conference coming up. It's not com- happening until October, 5th to 7th of October. Um, they're starting off with a tutorial day and a pre-conference social and hackathon, which sounds quite exciting. Um, but apparently in previous years, the events have sold out. So the organisers are encouraging early bookings. And if you go to the, uh, the website, you can find the link on our uh, show notes, um, something like conference.phpnw.org.uk, then there's a link there to enable yourself to sign up for spam to be told about all the exciting <laughs> offers uh, and discount talks and, 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 and codes and things. So Excellent. Excellent. Well, go along to that. It's a new season. It's another new segment. Got it. I can hey. tell you're keen. You can um, see we've been busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody has. Um, <laughs> basically, we've been rummaging around um, uh, here at UUPC Towers, and uh, two archivists by the name of Robin Catling and Victoria Pritchard um, have unearthed part of the Herbert Maxwell Fosdick Dyke Curmudgeon Memorial Sound Archives. That's and, easy for you to say. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, and have found a set of audio recordings that appear to contain some early technology review show from the mid-1930s under the banner of Tomorrow's Technology to Today, apparently, very little is known of the presenters, but research continues and more shows may well come to light. So we're going to share with you this very rare, apparently it was um, stacked just underneath a copy of Tenth Planet Episode 4, which is a Doctor Who reference. And lots of people on the internet. Laura would have got that if she was here. I got it. Uh, <laughs> I got it. So let's listen to this archive recording. Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire. In today's look at Tomorrow's Technology Today, which we recorded yesterday, we'll be telling you about all sorts of technology you can expect tomorrow, or the day after that. First off, the astonishing news that the electronic computer will be running the entire world before the end of this century. It may never replace Britain's own analytical engine, invented in 1837 by Charles Babbage, but according to this American chap, Thomas Watson, at International Business Machines, there could be a world market for as many as five electronic computers over the next 50 years. I don't see how electronics can possibly replace valves and crystals, but there you have it. How utterly splendiferous. And on the home front, please welcome our doyen of the domestic, Deirdre Morris Oxford. Hello, Deirdre. Hello, Douglas. It's Douglas. That's what I said, Douglas. So, Deirdre, what spectacle of tomorrow's technology have you for us today? Well, Douglas, there's a plan to replace the conventional gas oven with one that cooks food by using high-frequency radio waves to excite the molecules in food. Come now, Deirdre. If radio waves could generate that much heat, then surely this radio program would be frying our brains at this very second. I shouldn't worry your pretty little head over it, Deirdre. I have a degree in theoretical physics. Really? Well, that's all from tomorrow's technology today... Uh, today. A total pip and God save the king. Why don't I get to say goodbye? Just stick to the script, Deirdre.
Okay, we're here with Mahendra Mahay from the Dev CSI project. Hi, Mahendra. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank so, you for inviting me. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to start by just telling us a little bit about uh, a little bit about Dev CSI and what it is? Okay. Um, so, uh, let me just start off by saying what Dev CSI actually start, stands for. It's not. Um, Crime scene investigation. That's what <laughs> <Aww. people are. laughs> Short uh, interview. <laughs> um, so the dev bit stands for developer, right? And the CSI bit stands for community supporting innovation. So it's actually developer community supporting innovation, and it, the, the developer community actually um, is is particular is specifically focused on um, developers and programmers working in education in the UK. That's kind of its primary focus. Um, so people, programmers and developers working in universities, um, the majority of them are actually work in universities, but there are some developers that work and programmers who work in colleges and a few in schools. And so that's what the sort of acronym stands for. Um, shall I tell you a bit about where it sort of came from? Yes, please. Okay. Um, it all sort of came about about 2009. Um, there was an event that was organized, which is, is very much related to Dev CSI. If you kind of imagine Dev CSI as kind of being an umbrella and sort of other events kind of hanging underneath it. Um, the, the sort of the first events that kind of came around sort of getting developers from um, various sort of walks um, of life in university together, because um, you can imagine the term developer in in a university can mean lots of different things. Yeah. Mm. So, well, yeah, that that's, that was my first question actually. What, when you say developers, what what are these people doing? Are they like doing the internal websites, or what are they doing? Yeah, I mean, they actually, you know, it's it's a really good question because um, it, it means lots of different things. Sometimes they don't even have the word developer in their in their job titles. Um, but essentially, I mean, there's kind of there's lots and lots of different groups. Um, so it could be working on sort of the back end stuff of, of of the university websites. It could be integrating data between um, systems. So, for example, finance system, and the human resources system, or the um, registration system. So when students enrol, so it's kind of all the back end stuff, data right. integration. Mm -hmm. It could be working in research areas, so it could be in biology, it could be um, um, div um, programmers developing specific tools, so for example, um, in you know, kind of looking at um, gene data, for example, or in chemistry looking at visualizations of data. Um, it, it could be all sorts of things, really. Um, so you've kind of got back-end stuff, researchy stuff, um, and... You've also got sort of um, developers who uh, work with um, library systems, so the um, you know the books, the catalogs, um, publishing, so the stuff that universities produce, um, you know journals and articles and things. There's quite a lot of development in that area. So, given that you've got all these developers with a range of different interests and skill sets, what sort of support can you provide them? They're all going to need different things, aren't they? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, um, the I mean, what we found um, was that the Dev CSI project was really born out of a, a kind of a identifying a gap, really, because um, a lot of these um, developers kind of work in their own kind of little mini silos. Um, it's not exactly like the IT crowd, but they are kind <laughs> of kind of hidden away, and um, they're kind of managed. And I'm not sure a lot of their managers don't really understand what they do. Obviously, they have a, you know they have a high sort of technical knowledge, and their managers aren't always sort of have a developer background. Mm. Um, but they they they, they um, you know they um, they kind of do lots and lots of different things. Um, so. Um, Oh, sorry, I've lost my track. Um, so, so now we've got a picture of the kind of developers yep. that are going to come to yep. uh, Dev CSI type yep. events. What do they get? What do they get out of it? Why, why are they there? Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so um, what we kind of identified through the project was kind of a gap in the market, and um, they they may they may have their own particular interests in the technologies they're using within their own little domains. Mm -hmm. But what's not so, if you kind of imagine that's a kind of a vertical thing, so you know they can always learn more about Java, for example. Yeah. But what they don't do is they don't get together horizontally. You know, so they don't get together as a community. Um, there was nothing there was nothing like this at all before kind of Dev8D and Dev CSI came about. Um, there wasn't a chance for them to get together. Um, 
um, to meet each other because um, the developers don't really get out that much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is true. Um, hiding under blankets or whatever. So but, would that be like um, a developer in one university developing a library system, you know, wouldn't necessarily communicate with anyone else developing library systems elsewhere? Exactly. And obviously okay. you can see the advantages of them meeting up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they can share ideas, they can share experience, they can share knowledge. And if a developer somewhere has developed something really cool um, and they can share that knowledge. And developer culture tends to be very sort of sharing and willing to sort of share ideas um, and experience. Um, and that's not always the case in academia, actually, but especially in the developer community, it is the case. And mm. so if those, those people meet, they share ideas, they network. They, you know, one of the obvious things is they can, you know, they can save, they can save somebody else starting out on this path, you know, the similar path, a lot of time. So, so it's about kind of, sort of identifying other people who are solving similar problems to you and working yeah. out who's got there first and sharing the solution sort of thing. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, that's definitely one of the advantages. But the other advantage sometimes is where you get developers from two different, completely different domains using similar technologies but in completely different ways. Mm -hmm. And you know they, they they you know they can give each other kind of new perspectives. And they you know I'll give you an example. Um, this is an um, an example we we um, of an event that we we organised where we had a developer working at the University of Cambridge in the chemistry department was working on visualisations of of molecules. I'm not a chemist, so I don't really understand the full technology behind it. <laughs> I think um, that's but, sufficient detail. Yeah, they were kind of looking at sort of visualisations of some of the data. And, and he came to one of our events and sat next to a woman from the BBC, a BBC developer, who, was, who had kind of data in a similar format, but for television program data. They started off the conversation, and, and, they start, and, he says, and he says, well, why don't I try my software on your data? And that ended up being a funded project, you know, a European-funded project. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's just a small example of the kinds of things we're trying to um, sort of stimulate. You know, I mean, the, there's, there's a kind of innovation part of mm. the project, which is really about trying to get universities to be aware how important developers are to stimulating technical innovation in their universities, because mm. I'm not sure, we weren't sure at the time that, you know, a lot of universities actually understood, you know, developers can, you know, um, get universities to be very innovative. So, and I think at, at the time when we put the proposal together for the project, there were kind of austere times were looming. and. I think one of the reasons why we put the project together, we wanted to kind of raise the profile of developers because we, we were worried that a lot of them might be for the chop mm. um, because in our austere times, so the, ten, the tendency is to kind of outsource everything. Yeah, so, right. So one of the things you mentioned there, Mahendra, was about this particular one getting European funding. In, and I, I mean, obviously, this is a UK initiative. I just wondered what the kind of um, international connections you have are. I mean, you, you, looking at your, your website, it looks like you've done some challenges that have had some kind of international um, yeah, dimension. Yeah. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, developers um, exist I mean, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, we, we organise a lot of events, but we also sort of organise challenges. And there's a good reason for organising challenges. I mean, we run we run UK-based challenges, and that's partly to kind of get developers working in the sector to you know to to, to go for them, to win them, and it raises their profile. So it gives them a bit of kudos and gives them a bit of respect amongst their peers, especially. But also when they go back to their institutions. But we've also run global challenges. They, they tend to be in quite niche areas. Um, but um, we've kind of we've we run a, a kind of a big developer challenge, which sort of it's in its fourth year. Um, it, it's part of a sort of a big conference um, on something called open repositories, which is. It's not repositories in the sense that developers might understand that to mean. Um, in, 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 in some parts of academia, it kind of means um, a store of all the publications that the university produces. Things uh, like the open source project ePrints, is that right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, ePrints is, is an example um, piece of software that stores this kind of information. You know, it's essentially tends to be Word files, PDFs and things, but it's essentially the academic outputs of a university and making them freely available to, to the outside world. And um, we, we run a sort of developer challenge and we tried lots of different things. So the, this year's is taking place in July in Edinburgh and I'm going up to Edinburgh in the next couple of weeks and we're going we're gonna to sort of have a little planning meeting there to try to do some you know, innovative things, you know, learn from all the things that we've done in the previous years and try to do something a little bit different this year. And the reason, and, and one of the things we're thinking of is because um, it's going to be at the same time as the Fringe Festival, 
Um, we're thinking of kind of adding Edinburgh Fringe Festival elements in it just to make it a bit more fun. So cl- nice. Clowns and things? <laughs> Sorry? Hecklers. Clowns and things? Hecklers? What's well, not clowns, but do you know um, whose, line it is it any, whose line is it anyway? You yeah, know, where right. people throw out different random things, you know, from the audience. We were thinking of an idea around that, but I've got to keep it fairly secret because we're, we're, we're kind of like, we're, we're throwing up lots of little crazy ideas, but we're hoping that one of them will stick and we'll be able to sort of um, yeah. run with that when, you know, when we organise it. So when you, when you run these events, how, what sort of format do they have? Do you, you invite the developers or is it remote participation? How, how does that all work? Okay, um, so um, the, the sort of the annual event is Dev 8D, which is kind of, um, has kind of now fallen under sort of Dev CSI remit. So Dev CSI is the umbrella and Dev 8D sort of comes underneath it. Um, just importantly, there's an important thing I need to explain. Um, Dev 8D it's, a, it's an eight and a capital D. It's an emoticon. It, it oh, represents a, a happy geek. And the original idea for the event came from uh, two guys, uh, Ben Osteen and from Oxford. He was, he was developer at Oxford at the time, and David Flanders, who was at Birkbeck. And, and the idea was to run an event that uh, makes developers happy. And right. do you remember Happy Days? Sadly, uh, yes. You know, the fonts and hey and all that kind of thing. The, 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 <laughs> Nicely summarised. <laughs> well, it was, it was, hey and all that. And it was all. It was. It was really to run an event that w- was very playful in nature. It was fun, engaging, and kind of not kind of you know dare I say the kind of boring academic kind of event where you right. just death by PowerPoint kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the idea was to kind of organise an event that makes developers happy. So you know the idea was to go to developers. What makes you happy? And um, so, you know, we deliberately kind of organized the annual event to kind of make it very, very informal, um, lots of fun, lots of sort of creativity. Um, Can you um, give us some examples of like the sort of things that are making the developers happy? Um, okay, so this year, one of the, um, we, um, we sort of, we just, we just, uh, Dev AD runs around sort of February time, and, um, but this year, one thing that I was particularly really impressed with, with was the, you know, the brain band? Have you seen the brain band? No. No. Okay, that's really cool. Is this I, an alpha waves? Thing? Sorry? Is it an alpha waves? Yeah, thing? yeah, basically, right. it looks like, um, it looks like a John McEnroe, um, headband thing. Right. And you strap it to your head, and... It basically, it's very clever because the electronics within it um, picks up very, very small voltages and it, and it kind of takes out all the other sort of noise that it gets because your, your body apparently produces a lot of electricity much higher than the actual microvolts that are picked up from brain activity. I thought you were talking about the noise of Popey's think thoughts, which is, you know, <laughs> definitely <laughs> most of Yeah, them. I mean, um, it's kind of early days, but the idea is to use it as a, as a kind of an input device you right. know, for, for computers. So the idea is that wow. ultimately uh, you could think of up and you know once it establishes a pattern for up it would then use it as a command to control for example an r drone and they did try to get it um flying an r drone i don't know if you know an r drone is yeah yeah yeah. Um, got one of those um, polystyrene helicopter thing unfortunately i think they crashed the thing before they could actually try (laughs) oh you cannot be serious sorry you cannot be serious no they did Um, they were using it well they were practicing with a connect they'd connected a connect with it and they were flying Doing the hand movements to fly a Kinect. I meant to fly a, a, an R drone. Yeah, I saw John o- Jonathan Oxer did that at uh, Linux Conf Australia last year. That was really good fun. Uh, yeah, it's just really good fun, and it you know, I mean, fun. I mean, there have been some applications for this actually. Um, they've, they've used Kinect to do molecular visualizations in a chemistry department in in Cambridge. Actually, I've seen. You know, so this, the idea is to have a bit of fun. Right. Playfully, but then look at potential applications within educational context. Mm. And. And in order, you know, to organise these and get loads of people on site, how do you how do you finance this kind of thing? What, what, who who backs this? Okay, so um, the um, so the important thing to mention here is that um, um, the Dev CSI is actually funded by um, a funding body called JISC, which stands for the Joint Information Systems Committee. So the, the money comes from the government, mm-hmm. actually. Oh, that's good. And um, the there's two important aspects to JISC. Um, they fund something called Janet which is the Joint Academic Network. Which we is love Janet. <laughs> yeah, which is essentially the backbone for the internet for universities, colleges, and schools. Yeah. And then that's about half of their funding. And the other, the other half is really about supporting innovation. So they fund projects, um, you know, in the educational space. And the idea is um, they send out invitations to, you know, for projects in specific areas. Universities submit ideas, they get marked, and eventually they get, they get funded. And that's pretty much the sort of 
how we got funded. And um, we've been we've been really lucky, um, also, especially in these austere times. Um, we've been funded every year. And I think there was initial sort of scepticism to some of the things we were doing, but <laughs> I think now um, it's very kind of it's getting much much more established that developers are really playing a really important role in innovation in universities and and especially in austere times the universities that are going to survive are the ones who have some kind of capacity to innovate and that means on the technical innovation side you know they need to kind of keep their developers or we, we, those are the messages we're, we're trying to kind of spread that mm-hmm. you know they need to keep their developers Brilliant. because the developers can add value to what they do okay i think we're going to have to uh, have to leave it there because we're running out of time now but okay. thank you very much for coming on the show okay, yeah it's you. been really interesting thank That's, you very much yeah, very interesting <laughs> And now it's time for a bit of Adam and Two. Ian, yes, it look, is. looking yes, it at is. me, see if I say Gerald. I, we were. Oh, I was pausing. No, I didn't. Oh, so didn't uh, Ian Gerald. Farrell has opened submissions for the default wallpapers to be included in Ubuntu twelve oh four, and he's blogged about it on the Canonical Design Team blog. Mm. Yes, this is an opportunity where people can send in their nice photographs or graphic images or whatever. And yeah. this, this is one of them. This is not going to be good podcast, but no. look, that's one of them. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Tony looks at screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, got it's a, a very blue. Like, I it's imagine a, that's a pangolin. Is it? it is a pangolin oh. in a forest. There's, um, there's like 2,119 items in the wow. uh, Flickr group already. Christ. Yeah, he said there was like 350 in the first few minutes. So, um, <laughs> like, lots, oh. lots of people keen to get their artwork in the uh, distribution, but looks like. And yeah. if you are keen to get yours in there and you want to be one of them, you can tag it on Flickr and um, yeah. uh, it'll be considered be along with the people rest. at weddings. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't submitted any. <laughs> in my experience, the wallpapers that seem to be successful are the more kind of abstract ones anyway. So, you know, the corner of a table or something like that. Or kind of just blurry purple things yeah sort of vomit shaped stains on a, <laughs> on we a background <laughs> anyway canonical has integrated coverity a coverity co- co- oh la di da uh coverity a proprietary tool for performing code analysis to identify potential crash causing code and scaling issues into its code bases by producing an open source tool to work with Coverity Integration Manager, or CIM, the information com- from Coverity scans can be made available through Launchpad without community developers having to buy a Coverity license. So this is... I this think is, we could crowbar the word Coverity, coverity in there, in there and, one more time. This is proprietary software for the win, is it? Um, well, Made I'm available hosting. for free or something. It's not made available for well, free. Well, no, okay, no. so the scans, the results are made available for free without everybody having to buy their own I'm licenses, not, so I don't know good. if we're going to put all the results out. I know... Um, I know we've got a license to run it against a certain subset of what's on the CD. We can't just run it against everything. So, so, so you can't put all the results out. So there's going to be some secret. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think we've got a license to run it against the Unity code base because that's ours. Right. Yeah, we, we, you know, we, um, we're upstream for that. Right. So we wouldn't run it against Linux or Firefox or something so, like so that. They would do that. Is there any particular reason for using this instead of something like GCov or whatever else is available? I don't know. I guess the people who look at these things evaluated it and figured coverity was a good tool okay um and i trust ted gould because uh, he's yeah. very clever um but yeah one one of the cool things it does is um you know it does like all kinds of analysis about your code and if it finds a problem they've got it set up so it automatically creates a bug in launchpad um and points you to the bit of the code that's broken yeah. so in theory it makes it easier for the developers to just go and fix that piece of code or at least gives them more awareness of where the code is broken that's the theory anyway yeah. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that there wasn't anything that was open source that could be used. I mean, the one thing that open source is not short of is developer tools. Mm. Well, I don't they know. They the first uh, thing that come along, don't they? Yeah, but the kind of things like this, like compilers, like there's, you know, we've got all our open source compilers, which are great, like GCC, but I'm I'm sure I've seen um, reviews of compilers that show that the proprietary ones are better in that they produce leaner, faster code that's more reliable. For, but it, Yeah, I've seen those bug charts as well. Under some circumstances, they can produce faster code than so. So all I'm saying is others, that but... there are some companies out there who have proprietary tools that in some circumstances can do better than the open source tools, and there's not much we can do about that. Mm-hmm. You know, the Linux kernel for a very long time used BitKeeper 
yes. as the revision control yeah, system yeah. until a better thing came along, which happened to be written by Linus, which was Git. Well, until a better thing, he had to write yeah, it. Because say, yeah. got, he, didn't, he didn't just say, it was oh, somewhat I've forced. This. Yeah. 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 It's it in the backside but, by the fact that it was proprietary software. But nobody's, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's forced anyone to create a code verification tool, um, really, that I'm aware of. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a good, sounds like a good hackathon project, doesn't it? So, so what, Tony, I think there's another piece of um, information in the bit about Ubuntu that, that, that Alan's also very well informed about. So, yep, um... indeed. Uh, in fact, he was just telling us about this before. Uh, <laughs> DNS management is being overhauled in 1204 by the introduction of two new tools: uh, ResolveConf, which will hook into Network Manager and Network Configuration Files to manage name servers, while DNS Mask functions as a local DNS server to provide better support for VPN setups. So, when we say these are new tools, they're not actually new tools. No, no they're new to us. New, yeah. We're switching to them. New to Ubuntu. Well, new to the default install. Right. I mean, they're in the repository, in and you could, while, yeah. you could install them if you want to. And I used um, DNS mask years ago. Oh, yeah, so... Uh, plug server, in fact. So, yeah, as you know, ResolveConf is uh, a set of scripts and hooks for managing DNS resolution. <laughs> right. Uh, most That's notable, what I thought. Most that, that notable sounds... difference for users, actually, would be that any change manually done in slash etc slash resolve.conf will be lost, and that's quite so important. So where should you make those changes instead, Alan? Well, the, the problem is that gets overwritten uh, next time something triggers resolve.conf. So instead... Let me just go and change the Wikipedia entry he's uh, reading from. So, uh, <laughs> resolve.conf <laughs> uses DHCP client hooks. hooks. Yeah, you're, you're with me. Uh, you're, you're totally with me on <laughs> I'm this. Sort of, I mean, it's intuitive. I would it read is. that blog post. Stefan yeah. Graeber's a great guy. He knows loads and loads of stuff, and uh, read that. It's a good idea, because VPN configuration can be fiddly. Um, yep if you've got to muck around with your DNS settings, trying to use one DNS server locally and one DNS server at the other end of the VPN link to get the internal name resolution working and blah, 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 oh, blah. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now's a good time to put this in because it's an LTS. So, you know, something reliable and stable. And it's, it's not like we're changing the entire desktop. <laughs> it's, a, it's a because tiny... that would be insane yeah. <laughs> oh dear okay so uh, we've also got some not about Ubuntu go on Andy here. so uh, A.V. Miller of Oracle has given a talk at Linux Conf in Australia called uh, I Can't Believe This Is Butter a tour of BTRFS giving a functional introduction to the modern Unix, Linux file system. Now, I don't know if it's actually pronounced BTRFS because I don't use it. ButterFS. Yeah, is it he, ButterFS? He says ButterFS butter butter throughout. That would explain why it makes the joke it's funnier, part, doesn't it? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? It's um, an excellent video. It it's is a really, it's really good worth tool. It. Yeah, and it's, I mean, even I can understand it. Yeah. So, you know, it must be good. Wow. I, son, I Now I, I understand what uh, Hugo meant when he said it has super cow powers. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. it's really good. Do have to watch the video to find out. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to trying out ButterFS, and uh, um, I, I'm, at the moment I don't trust it well enough. Until Hugo, my friend Hugo, <laughs> tells me that it's good enough for me to put my data on, I'm not. So, so there's, an, there's, an, there's no. I mean, this is not about Ubuntu. So there's no thought of this becoming a default in any of the distributions. Actually, or, it's funny yeah. you should say that. I mentioned this video on Google Plus, and Robbie Williamson, who works for Canonical, from, said, hey. formerly from Foundations, I believe. Yes. Uh, so oh, we should figure out whether we can put this, you know, in uh, as a as an option in twelve ten. Yeah, so it, won't, it won't be in this one. Yeah. I'm sure I remember that it being said that ext four was basically just something better than ext3 until butterfs was ready essentially yeah. so, there's so many really cool things that you can and the great thing about this video is he gives real like concrete demos yeah. of things that you make a file system do. and then breaks it and then yeah. makes it makes it makes it fix itself again yes exactly it's been in the works for a long time as well i remember yeah. when we were in mountain view for uds they were talking about it uh then as one of the plenary sessions file systems are not something you knock up overnight no, really no, really. <laughs> unlike desktop environments unlike apparently. ntfs <laughs> NTFS is not too bad. And finally, in Not About Ubuntu this week, uh, Linus Torvalds has posted a bit of a rant on Google+, Plus, which will in entertain all but the OpenSUSE developers, we imagine. Mm. Okay, so this is a rant about security, isn't it? Yes, and what is sensible to secure by it, default and what it's, is... It's kind of harsh, and, and it, it's kind of directed at individuals, which is a bit out of order, but... Um, he has some interesting points. Yes. They need root uh, username and password in order to be able to connect to a wireless network, for and, example. And add a printer. Well, yeah, yeah. By basically OpenSUSE, it uses sudo, but unlike on Ubuntu where you run sudo and it says enter your password, on OpenSUSE, if you run sudo, it says enter the root password. Right. So you have to know the root password to use sudo unless you reconfigure your system. So, yeah, so unless you know that, yeah. you, you can't, can't reconfigure your system. system. Yeah, well, the scenario that Linus that. gives is um, his, I don't know if it's his daughter or his wife, was, I assume his daughter was at school and wanted to add a printer and 
phoned him up because he wanted to know what the root password was. <laughs> you know, that, that but, does but, seem a bit wonky. But, but Linus does know the, the root password of all Linux distribu- distributions <laughs> worldwide, right? Well, so. What's the point in developing uh, a system that's used worldwide unless you put a backdoor like that? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, an entirely uh, entertaining rant going on on Google Plus at the moment. But that is all about the bit about and not about Ubuntu for this week. <laughs> And we have a little bit of feedback for you uh, to round off the show. Uh, We have one from uh, Jack Denauer emailed in to say... Greetings from Riverview, New Brunswick, Canada. I discovered your podcast last week and have enjoyed the program thus far. I've been using Ubuntu since 2006 and have switched to Ubuntu on my laptop in November and will be switching my desktop over when 1204 arrives. Good man. (laughs) I won't go into the whys except to say that I am of an age where change is not my favourite topic. Then again, I understand KD has been changing of late. It fits my view of desktop presentation, and that's enough for me. Excellent. Good stuff, Jack. Although, way to avoid change by changing something. (laughs) (laughs) So Matt King sent us this note about cloud computing. I've just paused your podcast and mentioned this to you in regard to cloud computing offering off in, in regard to cloud computing offering offline modes. Here in the US, the Kindle Fire offers cloud computing with an optional offline mode for your music library. Yes, we talked about that, I think. But in doesn't it only have like four meg or gig or something small of memory in the first place? So it's not designed to hold lots of stuff or my misunderstanding? That, that was my understanding, but maybe I'm wrong too. I don't know, it's not available over here. No idea. Oh, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> so if everybody moves... You're, you lucky swine, Tony. Oh, Matt, Matt if no, you want to send us... Matt, Matt, if you want to send us all a Kindle all Fire so we can, we can find out more about it, then... Uh, <laughs> you know. Yes, we'll be in trouble if it doesn't work in the UK. Uh, uh, no, we'll just root in and put something else Okay. <laughs> Ubuntu on it. Ubuntu, yeah. Ollie Clark wrote in about our taste in music. Here we go. During the IRC conversation, during the live broadcast of episode 21... I was a little flippant about Tony's desire for some different show music. After I left, I thought I should be a little bit more constructive about the subject. I had an artist in mind, as I know he was considering releasing music under Creative Commons. I have now checked his website, and he releases the majority of stuff he does under the CC. And the guy's name is Kevin McLeod. Yes, thank you, Ollie. I did have a look and and a listen, and... uh... We haven't picked any of his tracks at the moment, but for those of you who are interested, we have some new house music, some intro music and outro music, not within the show, but for those who listen to the live stream, they hear music before and after. Why are you looking at me like I need to know We this? waffle on. I'm, <laughs> it's either that or look at Andy or Mark. So, you know, <laughs> better of the two options. Um, so, yeah, if you're listening to the live stream, you will hear brand new, exciting, well, not brand new, it's, it's about it's 70 75. years old, but different uh, house music. Excellent. Uh-huh. So listen to that. It's not like house music, the genre. It's yeah. no, it's <laughs> yeah. I don't really have. We need a better name for it, but it's cool and and studio and, A music. Yeah, that I would also use in a different. Studio. See, there's there's loads uh-huh. of um, shows that I, um, I listen to uh, that have uh, Creative Commons music. Um, John the Nice Guy has um, CC Hits, which is an automatically yep. generated show podcast show that has Creative Commons music on it. Um, uh, Dan Lynch with Rat Hole Radio has Creative yep. Commons music on his. That's great to listen to live and participate in the IRC channel. And my friend that I went to school with, Dave Lee, has one called The Bugcast, and he yes. plays lots of uh, uh, Creative Commons music as well. For about two years, I thought The Bugcast was a podcast where they look at bugs on Launchpad. <laughs> really? And discuss activity on those bugs, which is why I never bothered to listen. It's, it's very, very far <laughs> from that. Now I understand that, yes. but yeah. Anyway. In fact, if you tune into our live feed on a Friday evening, they piggyback off our um, our Icecast server. Yes. So if you accidentally tune in on a Friday night, you'll find music from recent times and not out of copyright music. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that because it's no, cool. <clears throat> Tony getting defensive. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to move along now and uh, play this voicemail that we've had in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> See, it was going so well. This will be edited out in the... Uh... Hello, this is Stephen from Ubuntu Ohio's program, The Burning Circle. Congratulations, guys, on starting Season 5. The air staff of the Eerie Looking Productions congratulates you and me. Every loco should have their own program. Rock on for Season 5, guys. Bye-bye. Rock on, indeed. The Burning Circle. Rock on. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Is that like oh, a map at the start of Bonanza? <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so thank you very much indeed Stephen uh, I, I think that's Alpaca Herder on, uh, on Twitter oh is it oh, oh right yeah, okay. if, if I've got the if I've got the mapping right that's the case um, okay so thank you for that uh, lovely greeting we're going to do our best to entertain you throughout the rest of the year uh, we'll be back in, in a couple of weeks time but that's all at the end of the feedback now <laughs> That's all for this episode. <laughs> Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels, and probably Google Plus as well. Let us know yes. what you think of the show, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us on Tuesday, 13th of March, for our next live episode. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Wowzers. Thank you very much indeed, Andy, for coming along yes. and participating yes. and being Thank our you for substitute, having me. Thank Laura. You. Well, well done on the season five i'm delighted to be here for the first episode of I season know. five who would have thought all those years ago that we'd still be here in the far <laughs> i'd still be in your lounge <laughs> i mean here. studio a. <laughs> don't, five, don't break the magic <laughs> five, five years on he won't leave <laughs> i'll have to change the locks see you next time bye-bye bye-bye, bye-bye.